This is a tough one, I'll tell you. Uh, one of our really good radiologists uh, sent this to me because uh, he knows I'm a pack rat. And when he did, it, it was one of those things that I thought to myself, yeah, I remember learning that, but I could not have come up with the name myself. So, acknowledging that fact. But this is what's known as a velamentous yeah, cord. That's right. <laughs> Right, and it's just an uh, an aberrant formation of the placenta that lets the large placental vessels all just stay on the surface. So you can see them here, all kind of coming together to the cord, which is probably right around in here, right? But they're all coming together into a an umbilical cord there, but they're lying on the surface of the placenta. And there's a particular risk of hemorrhage, of perinatal hemorrhage. So this is an important call to make in that it will probably prompt them to do a, a cesarean section. I mean, obviously, you don't want a child's head sliding over that during labor. It could be potentially disastrous. Intussusception is correct. Very good. I heard someone say recently you want to see vessels and fat because those are the mesenteric components that get pulled into the intussusceptum, which intussuscepts into the intussusceptiens. So you can see that uh, the intussusceptum, you're always going to want to see a hyperechoic ring, and it does look a little targetoid too, which is the common term applied to these. Very good. You don't see flow in that left testicle. What else don't you see in that left scrotum? Yeah, it, there's not a very clear testicular margin. Right, exactly. You really don't see a testicle proper there, right? Yeah. You don't see homogeneous testicular parenchyma with a clear definition in its <laughs> circumference. This is a testicular rupture. So all that heterogeneity <laughs> you're seeing there on the left side is just hemorrhage. And the little dots of flow you're seeing are probably active bleeding. So yeah, that is a testicular rupture. Interesting thing about these, uh, they've determined, actually, I think the article was 96. Prior to these, they just sent you home with an ice pack. Uh, but in 96, they determined there's actually a statistically significant incidence of infertility in people who have unilateral testicular ruptures. And they think it might be an immune response to testicular contents, uh, basically being exposed to systemic immune surveillance. Uh, but they're not really sure what the mechanism is because uh, that percentage of people with unilateral testicular ruptures that show up infertile, when they look at the opposite side testicle, there isn't a lymphocytic infiltrate. And you would expect that to be there if it were all immune mediated. So anyway, interesting point that Yes, you do only need one to maintain fertility, but there is a risk of infertility even if you just shatter one testicle. That's what the acute ruptures, of course, you know, doesn't apply to people born with one or with one undes undescended. Right, so what's happened is, look at the undersurface of the placenta right there. It act, this actually is a placental abruption. And you see the irregularity on the myometrial aspect of the placenta. It's all irregular and indented, full of fissures, basically. So it looks all ratty, as though it's been pulled off. And so this is all hemorrhage in here. And there are a couple of spots of active bleeding within it. But look how it's, it's almost like a ring of fire, right? Look at all the hemorrhage along the uh, detached aspect of the placenta. So you want to look really carefully for the placenta. And when you see undermining hypoechoic stuff like this, that's when you start thinking of placental abruption. And most of them do involve a marginal edge of the placenta, which you can see this does as well. 
the ones that are really dangerous supposedly are the ones that are central because they don't present with bleeding as early and they develop really, really high pressure and then they blow. Uh, but the vast majority of placental abruption, <laughs> abruptions will involve a, the margin of the placenta. So, and it's picking out that the thickness of the myometrium in an uninvolved area that t you know, tells you, I'm going to go over here and find that thickness and that echogenicity underlying my hyperechoic placenta. Right, and you really can't pick it out here. Placental abruption, I think, is a tough call to make, but unfortunately, it's one that uh, definitely falls to us. Nobody else is going to make it, and it's a significant abnormality. This is a torsion. And uh, so there's no flow in the ovary, right? And that's, that's the main thing to go by. I will tell you guys, there's a, I've got a new warning to give people. Uh, in addition, sorry, the peripheralization of follicles. Because when an ovary torses, it gets edematous in its stromal center first. And that edema pushes the follicles out to a more peripheral location in the cortex of the ovary. So that's an important point to look at. And there's your edematous stroma and absent flow. Um, the thing I saw someone burned on, it was actually a testicle, but I think the, uh, the rule applies to both. The text will put calipers on an area of color flow. And if they can only find color flow in the periphery of a gonad, they, you know, they'll go after it wherever they can find it. So we had a medical malpractice case where the tech put calipers on a dot of color flow at the very periphery of the testicle, and what she caught was scrotum. And there's clearly, right, that's a risk. You get the kind of ring of fire of hyperemia around a torsed gonad. So there's all kinds of color flow to select from, but it's outside the gonad. And sometimes it can be hard to tell. So the important point there is flow in a regular organ is usually high resistance. It's the waveform you're used to seeing, like when we do arterial waveforms looking for stenosis. A high resistance waveform has a sharp upstroke and a sharp downstroke, and it returns to baseline quite quickly. That is as opposed to a low resistance waveform, where it's Rise is blunted, and it doesn't always come right back to baseline quickly. So it's uh, uh, more of a hump than a spike, right? And low resistance waveforms are seen in the gonads. They're also seen in the brains if you ever do intracranial stuff, uh, say on infants, right? But those are low resistance organs. And so the waveform will look different. And so always check that waveform and make sure that it doesn't look like an old-fashioned arterial waveform, right? It shouldn't be a really pointy spike. It should be a little smoother. And that is an additional finding you can go by to make sure that the uh, calipers you're looking at, the flow you're looking at, are truly within uh, the gonad. So I'll give you one hint that people have found helpful because a lot of people go to calcifications on this, right? You've got these hyperechoic white dots spread throughout the liver. Those are not calcifications. Now, when you get really tiny calcifications, they may not shadow. So the absence of shadowing next to a small white dot uh, doesn't tell you for sure that it's not calcium. Most calcium, if it's dense enough or big enough, certainly will cast a clean shadow. And I would just say with that many white dots all throughout the liver, it's pretty odd that not one of them is casting a shadow. So I think you can look at that and say, okay, this is not calcification. So the pneumobilia or portal venous gas? 
<laughs> Correct. And uh, this actually, you know, it's hard to tell, but which direction would you say this is going? The other thing is it's, it is pretty far out in the periphery. Certainly it's more clustered here centrally, but it is making it out to the edges of the liver, right? You can still see hyperechoic foci out here. Good, though, that you've spotted that that actually is gas. And they're small enough, too, where they're not causing dirty shadowing either. But these are air bubbles in the portal vein. And they're just, just discernible as probably headed to the liver rather than out away from it. Right? Because remember, portal venous gas, because of the direction of portal flow, portal venous gas will distribute to the periphery of the liver. So again, you can see these dots way out here, right? And portal venous gas may not make it all the way out to the outside of the liver, but if there's anything in, say, the peripheral third of the liver, you can be pretty sure it's not pneumobilia. Pneumobilia, more than portal venous gas, has a tendency to concentrate centrally, uh, more so than portal venous gas has the ability to get out peripherally. So when you see stuff that's just in the center of the liver, you can be pretty sure that's pneumobilia. Um, if you don't see it all the way out to the periphery of the liver, it can still be portal venous gas. It'll make it most of the way. But that's pretty cool that you can see the dynamic uh, bubbles in the portal vein. So your differential on that is just ischemia or infection. That's one I like to see because there's not a lot of talking to do about it. This is, I will actually give you the anatomic location. This is in the popliteal fossa. I still laugh whenever I see a case of this because I'd never heard of it. And then one of my residency colleagues actually had it. And so Thanks. he had an angiographic repair and all these cool uh, images of him getting a stent put in there. And then ultimately it didn't take and he had to get surgery and and every time we, had, we as residents were required to do a case presentation, he showed his own films. Like year <laughs> after year after year, he never made another presentation. And so I knew cystic <laughs> adventitial disease backwards and forwards. And it's so rare, I never saw another case for like 20 years till finally this one came along. Uh, they don't know why it happens, but you get this marked thickening of the arterial wall and these little, this cystic degeneration within that thickened wall. And it ultimately uh, can, of course, thrombose and occlude the vessel. So, and it's always in the popliteal artery. I've never seen it anywhere else. Well, I've only seen it like three times at this point in my whole career, but it's always in the popliteal artery. All right, you guys, right. very good. And there's the axials. I hope that uh, helps with your ultrasound interpretations.